Good evening and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. I'm Mina Kim, KQED News anchor and also the Friday host of KQED's forum program. And I'll be your moderator for the program tonight, which we're calling A Tale of Two Cities, San Francisco and Detroit. Each city is home to vibrant communities with strong leaders and anchor institutions, but they've suffered historic disinvestment. They're in need of more investment in infrastructure, more civic attention, especially for issues relating to children. And in neighborhoods across these two geographies, community leaders, advocates, and policymakers are looking for equitable development strategies that let communities thrive. So tonight, we're very pleased to have major foundation leaders from each city. We have Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation with us, and Tanya Allen, CEO of Detroit's Skillman Foundation. And let me tell you a little more about both of them. So Tanya Allen calls herself a serial ideapreneur, serving as the Skillman Foundation's president and chief executive officer. Her two-decade-long career has centered on executing and investing in ideas that improve her hometown of Detroit and reduce the plight of people, especially children, who live in under-resourced communities. She's been instrumental in such successful initiatives as the 10-year, $120 million Good Neighborhoods Initiative, which significantly increased graduation rates and youth programming while reducing child victimization. Grow Detroit's Young Talent, which increased summer jobs for youth, and the Coalition for the Future of Detroit School Children, which successfully advocated for $667 million for Detroit public schools. She's also served as chair of the Campaign for Black Male Achievement and co-chair for My Brother's Keeper Detroit and Executives Alliance for Boys and Men of Color. She was named a Detroit News Michiganian of the Year in 2015 and holds a master's in social work and public health from the University of Michigan. Please welcome Tanya Allen. And next to her is Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation, one of the largest community foundations in the country. The San Francisco Foundation works with donors, community leaders, and public and private partners to create thriving communities throughout the Bay Area. Since joining the foundation in 2014, he's led its renewed commitment to social justice through an equity agenda focused on racial and economic inclusion. He's an Oakland native and has served as interim city administrator for the city of Oakland and executive director of the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency, as well as director of the San Francisco Mayor's Office of Community Development. He currently serves on the boards of SPUR, the Bridgespan Group, the Dean's Advisory Council for Berkeley's College of Environmental Design, and the Community Advisory Council of the San Francisco Federal Reserve, among others. He's a visiting professor in the Department of City and Regional Planning at UC Berkeley, from which he holds a master's degree in city planning. Please welcome Fred Blackwell. <laughs> and they asked me to shorten their bios, but I just, I just couldn't. <laughs> it is one of the most uh, uncomfortable experiences <laughs> is to have someone read your bio. Well, to get everyone here in San Francisco up to speed, Tanya Allen, with what's happened in Detroit in the last several years. I mean, in 2013, the city had the unenviable enviable distinction of being the largest city in America to have declared bankruptcy. And so walk us through the municipal bankruptcy process and how getting through it really laid the foundation for Detroit's, what's being called Detroit's comeback. Great, yeah, so I think one of the biggest um, things that most people don't know is that since 1950, Detroit has probably lost a million residents. So in the 1950s, we were about 1.8 million people. Today, we're about 650,000 people inside of a city that is the same. So Detroit is so large. It's 139 square miles. You could fit San Francisco, Boston, and Manhattan in it and still have 30 square miles left. So um, when you lose that many people, the, the footprint doesn't shrink. Um, and as a result of that, um, we have seen our city really strain to basically provide the type of services and supports that you would need to do. And I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't indicate that part of the reason that our city had such um, challenging and uh, fiscal cha problems is that our state actually stopped revenue sharing. So the state had a great deal of culpability in the city's bankruptcy. And so when that happened, um, 
Uh, so the state stopped giving revenues, and then the state decided that the city didn't know how to manage itself. And they, uh, so basically we had an emergency manager that was put in place of our city. And that emergency manager declared bankruptcy. Uh, and so the bankruptcy was basically quickened um, because there was um, uh, an agreement made to make adjustments to the pension cost in Detroit um, by kind of doing a, a three-way deal where we protected the art in the Detroit Institute of Art, which if you've never been to Detroit, it's a great treat. The museum is amazing. Uh, and then um, preserved some of the um, benefits and uh, retirement benefits for many of the uh, city workers who were there and, if I and, just and that adjustment. So ask you quickly, just to give people a sense, what was the average pension of the people who, who actually ended up having to take a cut? Yeah, so I, that is a great question because the average pensioner um, had benefits of $18,000 a year. And for police officers, it was about 27 or 28. So a lot of times you'll hear in Detroit, people will talk about the grand bargain and public, I mean, the private philanthropy played a significant role in that, where um, many of them, including the Skillman Foundation, put resources there to help um, the negotiations. And people will herald philanthropy. But in actuality, when I talk about the people who gave up the most, those were the people who were once uh, city employees. Uh, they are the real heroes in the Detroit bankruptcy story. So I know that you're saying that, yes, people do herald philanthropy. You were one of the philanthropists that really came out to talk about how we needed to protect the pensions, right? But at the same time, I think you were very sensitive, it felt like, to ensuring that philanthropy philanthropy and philanthropists, it didn't feel like they were coming in and dictating what folks in Detroit had to do to get out of this situation. Right. So we, the Skillman Foundation was the last private foundation to come in, and we actually didn't um, make investments in uh, the negotiation around employee, around um, retiree benefits. Partially because I really believed that if we would have made an investment that we were having too much influence on um, the bargaining power of the retirees. Hmm. And, uh, and I just felt like that was not the role of philanthropy. That's my personal opinion. I felt um, that we were, in some ways, uh, we did a good thing and that we quicken the, rec the um, bankruptcy process. But in a lot of ways, it just hurts my heart, honestly, that we really prevented many of these retirees to have a real negotiation process. Uh, so we did help around many of the um, things post-bankruptcy on how to make sure that um, the right retirees would have access to health care and that their children, many of them who are raising children or grandchildren, that they would have it as well. And then I would, la lastly, I would say this is because I think it's really important. I think I probably had more of a personal sensibility around this is because I grew up in Detroit. My mother-in-law is a city retiree. This is not a distant uh, conversation for me. It is not an intellectual exercise. I don't, you don't get to pat yourself on the back when you know people that this is affecting and that you know that we as philanthropy, um, including the Skillman Foundation, we gave money away, which is, by the way, our job, right? It is not the job of retirees to give away what they earned. And so I felt like they did a greater service to our city um, than anyone. And so I just, uh, every time I get a chance, I just want to lift them up because I do think that they did remarkable work for our city to make sure that it um, still lives and that it's thriving. Well, before um, I get more into the things that the Skillman Foundation did to help invest in Detroit and especially Detroit's children. I wanted to ask Fred, as you're listening to Tanya describe the challenges that uh, Detroit faced, the, uh, the, you know, how it played out in terms of state and city government or just even the issues that they were trying to deal with, do you hear parallels with issues that San Francisco has had? Yeah, I, 
I'll, I'll talk about that. Before I do that, though, I, and I won't be long on this, because if I speak too long on it, I will probably shed a tear. Uh, but it is um, important to me in talking about San Francisco tonight, as well as um, uh, talking about the issues facing this city, uh, just to acknowledge the, the leadership of Mayor Lee and, and his passing. I think many of the things that uh, I'm going to talk about tonight are issues that he de cared deeply about. and. Um, Many of the things that we were working on at the foundation were things that we were working on with uh, his administration. So I do just want to uh, offer my condolences to his family and also uh, just acknowledge uh, uh, his leadership in this city. Um, you know, um, there are, in, in some ways, the story that, that is, was told by Tanya just now, I, I'm not familiar with, uh, to, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, first of all, you know, San Francisco, and you know, just I'll mention Mayor Lee again. I um, was working for Mayor Lee uh, when he first came into office, and uh, when he came into office, we had um, double-digit employment uh, here in San Francisco, and it, it was astounding to me in how short a period of time we went from uh, every day talking about how we could create jobs in here in uh, San Francisco, keep tech in town, uh, to getting to a situation where um, the economy was white hot, uh, employment was low. Uh, we went from uh, hoping to have Google to protesting Google buses. Uh, and uh, really kind of in a situation where we were trying to figure out how to harness uh, a very robust economic situation for folks who were being left out of the opportunities and uh, the wealth and economic uh, uh, gains that were being achieved uh, in the city. So uh, the, the story that, I ca that comes up in my mind around the challenges uh, here in San Francisco, specifically in the Bay Area in general, is how can we create a situation where the rising tide is lifting all boats yeah. uh, and where uh, people don't feel like they are limited in terms of their ability to access what is to offer here in this city um, based on where they're living or uh, what their family's economic status is. I, one of the projects that we're working on, uh, again in partnership with the city, is a project called uh, Hope SF, uh, where we are um, seeking to um, revitalize in partnership with the city some of the most distressed public housing in the city, do that without displacement, and do it uh, in a way that focuses just as much on the kids and families that are living in that housing as we focus on the bricks and mortar. That housing is, you know, we're smaller than Detroit, so it is six miles away max from the Salesforce Tower. But if you're growing up there, it feels like it's hundreds of miles away from mm -hmm. the Salesforce Tower in terms of your ability to access it and identify with, with what's going on there. So I, it's, a, I think, a quite different situation. It's a uh, different here, situation, Francisco. though. Well, a couple of things that it makes me think about, Tanya. I mean, here in San Francisco, we have a lot of wealth. The economy is doing very well. But we have pockets, as Fred was describing, right, where people are not feeling the economic gains that we've made. Detroit, it feels like, is slightly the opposite in that there are pockets of Detroit that are booming, but the overwhelming uh, picture in Detroit is one still of poverty um, and, and trying to deal with the effects of that. And so how, A, talk a little bit about how your investment in children is trying to address that bigger picture, and B, also how this comeback is playing out um, given that kind of landscape. Right. No, I'm glad you made that distinction because that's absolutely right. Um, that is the context of Detroit. But I would say where I think there is commonality is that um, I would surmise that we both agree that talent is distributed equally, but opportunity is not, right? And so basically what we're trying to do, regardless if you are in a prosperous city or a poor city, is to make sure that opportunity is available to everyone. 
And I would say th that is what the Skillman Foundation is committed to, is really building out this opportunity agenda for children in the city of Detroit. We are focused on making sure that kids have access to education and um, can find um, a way into the economy so that they can be prosperous, that they can uh, create a, I like to talk about it as a, a generational trajectory for their families, like that they can reshift that trajectory so that they can be prosperous and they can participate in the revival of the city. So um, when I think about Detroit in particular, I often reflect on places like San Francisco and uh, in Seattle and Boston and New York, 40 years ago, you were not in the predicaments you are in today. 40 years ago, you probably were looking a lot more like Detroit. <laughs> and so when I think about today, where you are, you're the hotbed of, of uh, innovation. You're the hotbed of the nation's economy. So when I think about Detroit, I'm like, we have that possibility in front of us that in 40 years, we can literally be the center of um, the country's economy. And so when I think about the work that we're doing in Detroit on behalf of children and families, I'm trying to make a generational play. I understand that my work is not about just what I can do today or what's gonna happen this year. It has to have a longer, more meaningful impact. And so, um, I think that's reflected in the work of the foundation. We just finished, as you mentioned, um, an initiative called the Good Neighborhoods Initiative where we invested deeply in um, six areas in Detroit uh, for 10 years. Uh, so we were there longer than any politician in the city of Detroit. Uh, so, and worked <laughs> deeply with residents and with nonprofit leaders and with businesses to make investments in there and had great results in terms of impact on ter in terms of children, in terms of their safety, um, in terms of their education and access to opportunities. And uh, I think that is the role that we want to play is that as we look to see the city recover is to make sure that our recovery actually um, is about building new systems that actually enables all children to have access to the opportunity. Are you also concerned about gentrification that Detroit as pockets of it start to resurrect as some people put it or even are booming right that I guess the question I would have is do you see San Francisco as a cautionary tale to some degree because of our sky-high rents the fact that we've yeah. had difficulty with displacement yes I I do see it but I would say I here are the distinctions I would make so right now Detroit is um facing some gentrification but what we're doing now is gentrifying the gentrifiers uh, so we had a first round of gentrifiers and they're being gentrified. Um, and, but I would say that where the, the challenge in Detroit is that we've named a few, um, I would say boutique places in our city that people want to make investment in. That's where they make, they're making deep investment. That's where people want to live. Now, I think they, talk, I can't remember. It's like, I think they talk about it as like, 7.2 or 8.2 square miles or so. Now, I told you that the city is 139 square miles. So you have this investment going into very small areas, and then you have the remainder of the city where there is no investment. And so in a lot of ways, I think like the borders of the city is becoming, like in places like San Francisco or Seattle, you see the suburbanization of poverty. It's happening in Detroit too, but we haven't hit the borders because we're so large yet. So what we're doing is kind of pushing out poverty to the edges of the city. And that's where we see some of the challenges. And then the last thing I would say related to this is that there is no lack of place places to live in the city of Detroit the challenge is for us is that families because we don't have the kind of job and economic base that a place like San Francisco have you can find a place but whether it has lights and whether it has water 
is the challenge that most people are facing, is that we have gotten a callousness in our city right now um, uh, because we're so ready to recover that we're forgetting that the people actually have to have a quality of life and that there should be some things that are inalienable, that we should not say you can't have water if you can't pay for it. Um, Not when we got a river with the with the best water in the country there we got we just have to figure out how to resolve some of those things i know there's tensions around how you manage that but um i don't think we spent enough time doing that in detroit in, Brett, what, yeah. what advice would you, I mean, would you have yeah, for Tanya? Uh, you know, if you could, if you <laughs> could go back, Brett, yeah. right, and look at how San Francisco grew and about the investments that, that Mayor Lee made, right? And I think his heart was in the right place, but it had a, a pretty profound sure. effect in terms of our city's, you know, high, high cost. Yeah, there are, there are so many thing, issues that Tanya has raised that uh, I want to jump on and, and kind of talk about parallels and differences. One. Uh, is this fact that, you know, the title of this uh, discussion around the tale of two cities, we're talking about in terms of Detroit versus San Francisco, but in Detroit and San Francisco, it can be applied to those cities individually. uh, In the fact, in terms of what she's describing, in terms of some cities that are thriving, in some parts of the city that are thriving, enjoying a lot of uh, attention, enjoying a lot of investment where there are other parts of the city that are still starving for investment and are starving for uh, institutions that provide access to opportunity for the families and the children uh, that are living there. And I think what she described in terms of Detroit actually has a lot of similarities in terms of San Francisco and, and the region. And so I think that that's something for folks that are working in places to keep in mind. I think one of the the other pieces to this, though, is that um, you know, in some ways, the city is an important, uh, yet uh, at the same time, inadequate kind of um, um, level of geography to pay attention to because um, there's a need to, just like Tanya is doing, drill down in neighborhoods for long periods of time and support leaders, support organizations that are doing that work at a very micro level, uh, but at the same time, there is the need, at least for us, and I think it's probably the same there, to think about these um, issues regionally as well. Uh, that these issues around housing and jobs and transportation uh, and criminal justice issues are not issues that pay attention to these borders that we have drawn from one uh, city to the next in the Bay Area. And more and more, people are talking about the need to think about these issues on a regional level. I, I think. Um, the, the other piece, and I think is particularly important for uh, philanthropy, is I think sometimes um, we fall into the trap of thinking that because we have the resources and we have the money, we actually know what needs to happen. Um, and uh, I think one of the things that uh, is important about the way that Skillman has approached the work, especially when I hear her talk about uh, the, the need to really lift up uh, and support and uh, recognize the sacrifices that were made by folks who had pensions. It is the folks on the ground who live in these communities, who are working in these communities, who are working in in these community-based organizations that know what needs to happen. Uh, And while it is important from time to time for us to bring our voice to the discourse uh, and to uh, bring our own advocacy to the table around this stuff, we have to be careful around when that's appropriate and when it's not. Uh, And so I think that that is a very important part of the work. Right. And I would just say, I I think a lot of times people in philanthropy, like we like to think because we want to do good, that that's the only thing we want. We want to own. Like I always say, you got to you can't just own your intent, you have to also own your impact. And so just because you want to do good doesn't mean that you actually are doing good and you should have some responsibility in in that. And I think that's why I'm very conscientious in general about um, we should be contributing, right? I, I view the Skillman Foundation as an embedded foundation, like meaning we're not going anywhere. We're a Detroit-based foundation. 
Um, we are deeply rooted in that in our community. We don't get to select and choose which city that we want to go to and which one, which organizations are the kind of high heeled organizations in our city. And we only want to invest in these organizations. We're investing in lots of organizations, and the problems of our city are our problems too. Like so, we have to be deeply embedded, listening, understanding, working with people in community, and sometimes. Um, that might mean we disagree on, on what the solutions are, but we have to be a part of the discourse. And I think that what the challenge we might see in places like San Francisco or Detroit is that when we believe that we're having discourse because we've created the discourse, that's a flaw. Meaning like I have, I'm interested in doing this work. So now I'm going to set the container. I'm going to invite everybody to the table to talk, except most of the people at the table are sitting in folding chairs, right? Like they don't have permanent seats there. They don't get to shape what the conversation is going to be about. What they get to do is to give you feedback about what you want to talk about, and then I will determine whether or not I actually will take your feedback and integrate it in my work or not. That's not discourse. That's not um, a part of, a, that is not a responsible way to participate and work in community. And I don't say that um, thinking or assuming that the Skillman Foundation knows how to do it. I'm saying it that I have made that mistake before, and I've tried as much as I can, I wanted to curse. <laughs> I try as much as I can to not repeat the mistake and to call it out if I see others doing it. Well, let me ask you about, because we have some questions here around education, and I think that that is a sector in particular, right? When you're going in, you're trying to create change, but there are definitely a lot of people who've existed in that sector who feel like they really know and understand how it should be done. And so how do philanthropy organizations approach that. So you have a question here, I'm gonna read two of them, but one is the schools really suffered in Detroit. It seems like we may have dug a deep hole for these children. How can this be addressed given the magnitude of the harm done? And then another question about Oakland, our public education system specifically in Oakland are facing dire budget cuts and potentially state receivership. Tanya, can you share the role Skillman and philanthropy played in turning around the Detroit public school system who did you bring to the table? How did you prevent state, uh, I, I'm assuming they mean like some state takeover, state control, yeah. state intervention? Well, we didn't prevent it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think what we have done is work to try and change it. But I would just say whoever <laughs> asked the question is absolutely right. Um, we have not done well in um, Detroit around education, um, but I would say that education in Detroit has suffered the same kind of constraints that we have seen um, within our municipal system as well. So basically our school system uh, is a third of its size from 15 years ago. So name a company that you know that's a third of its size from 15 years ago and is still functioning and doing a good job. And it didn't help us at all that we basically did have emergency management, a receiver come from the state, multiple ones. So every 18 months they changed it because that was a part of state law. Um, and they were managing from a fiscal perspective and they didn't do a fine job at that because we were still at the end of the day about $700 million in debt. Um, and, uh, so one of the things that we, and um, the last thing that I would just add that most people don't understand is that we have a very robust choice system in Detroit. So um, Michigan's uh, gift, and this is sarcasm to the country, <laughs> is our Secretary of Education. And, uh, and so, I would say that what we saw in general in Michigan was a um, choice system that was executed. And now, let me just be clear, I am a pro-choice person. However, I am not a pro-choice person at the cost of everybody in, else. And so what we've had is a um, marketplace that has had no rules. 
So we have a um, very dispersed ecosystem where there's literally nobody in charge of all of the children in Detroit. So recently, um, the Skillman Foundation and I was a partner along with about 40 other uh, colleagues in Detroit that included um, Republican, Democrat, business community, parents, educators, um, any group that you can imagine, activists um, to faith leaders. We got everybody at the table and many of us spent lots of time fighting each other and so we had two rules. One is leave your weapons at the door. <laughs> and then the second rule was that um, we were gonna execute based on this 70-20-10 framework. Meaning that if most of us, if we care about an issue that for the most part, 70%, if you really fundamentally care about an issue, 70% of what you ought to do, most of us can agree on. There's another 20% that we would disagree on, but we could probably negotiate. And then there's a 10% that we will never agree on. And instead of starting at 10%, we said we were gonna start at the 70 and work our way as closely to 90 as we possibly can on behalf of our children. That resulted in um, legislation being passed that actually um, addressed the debt in the city for about $667 million for our school system, kept it alive. Um, it gave us back an elected school board. Um, it also um, retired a um, a kind of recovery district, a statewide recovery district and move those schools back into our system. And it put in some guardrails around charters and charter authorizers uh, in the city of Detroit. So um, yeah, one of the things I wanted to add, Mina, um, it kind of goes back to a question that you were asking a couple of uh, questions ago around kind of advice. And this is Less uh, advice around uh, to Tanya, because I'm sure uh, what I'm about to say will resonate with her. Uh, but for folks who are um, doing work in urban areas in this country, uh, if they want to understand what the uh, challenges are uh, on the horizon for their city, uh, all you really have to do uh, is look at how African-American folks are faring in their city today. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I wanted to bring that up because uh, here in San Francisco, uh, you know, I was working in the Newsom administration in, uh, you know, probably 2005, uh, and the situation that was uh, being described in the African American community then is that they had gone from 12% of the city to not enough uh, black people in San Francisco to fill Candlestick Park. Uh, the housing affordability issues, the inability to find uh, employment that could uh, support a family, uh, the issue around working hard but not being able to afford the median price of a home in the city. These were all issues that those folks were experiencing and we were experiencing back then. And what's remarkable about it is those are the narratives that you hear right now from the whole community uh, about what the challenges are in terms of living here in San Francisco. Uh, and so I don't say that to uh, minimize the experiences of other ethnic groups, but I think it is uh, important for us to recognize that the African-American community in urban centers has borne the brunt of a lot of the policies, procedures, practices that have led to the kind of in inequalities and inequities that exist in urban centers right now and that we're now trying to address. Right. Well, well I mean, uh, I, you know what's amazing about it is like, uh, I agree with that point so much because it's, I feel like a lot of times it's like a, uh, these communities are like petri dishes, right? And so when I think about the stuff that has happened in Detroit, particularly around schools, it's like it, and when more than almost half the population in the city of Detroit goes to charter schools, most of the people who open these charter schools have not had a proven record in doing that. Now there are some that are extraordinary schools, so I, I'm not, this is not a, I am not um, castigating charters. What I would suggest is that we, there is, we believe it's okay for experimentation when they're not our children. 
And so we have to move away from that. And I think that we have to call out injustice wherever you see it. And, uh, and also understand that a lot of the stuff that we're talking about, when you talk about regions, when you talk about opportunity, when you talk about criminal justice, all, I mean, this is all basically um, spatialized racism, right? And so when you start to allow that injustice to happen with certain populations, it's gonna spread. Well, there are a couple of questions here that are directly related to the things that you are talking about right now. And we have a lot of questions, just I'm FYI. Sure. There are a lot of questions <laughs> here. And several of them that have go blue at the end. So that's oh, go uh, blue. That's for you, Tanya. <laughs> which actually is also my alma mater. I don't know. If you know but um, so this one is for you, Fred. What is happening in each city to create enterprise zones for historically black neighborhoods? For example, black owned business incubators, entrepreneurial programs that are community based. Yeah. Um, the short answer is not enough. Um, but I think that um, there are some things uh, that are happening. There are a lot of uh, programs being pushed out uh, that um, in Oakland and in San Francisco that are starting to recognize the importance of uh, small business uh, development and growth uh, for sustainable and equitable uh, economic development. And ironically, I hate to keep doing this, but in the last uh, big meeting that I was in with Mayor Lee, he was talking about how one of the things that would need to be focused in on was this issue around small businesses and their relationship to uh, economic opportunity. I think that um, one of the things that is important for us to think about, I think whether it's around this issue around small business or enterprise zones or, or other in the, this issue around uh, race is I think that we often uh, come to the conclusion uh, that one community's gain has to be another community's setback. Mm. Um, and uh, the reason why that frame uh, is important for us to uh, get rid of is because when we uh, really, in a real way, um, focus in on um, disproportionately trying to meet the needs of the most vulnerable among us, I believe firmly that we all benefit. Uh, and so it's why I brought up the issue of the experiences of African Americans as a kind of canary in the coal mine for uh, some of the things that are going to be happening uh, in the future. And so uh, what ends up happening, and this is a long-winded way to get here, is that one of the things that prevents us from having targeted race-specific programs and interventions like that is that frame, uh, is the notion that what we really need to do is have equal access for everybody. And I don't uh, agree with that. I think we sometimes need to uh, invest disproportionately in some of the folks uh, that have high need. And I think that when we do that, we can expect the benefits to accrue to a, a community that is much broader than that one that you're focused in on. Well, <laughs> sort of along these lines, and, and Tanya, you can start by answering this question if you'd like. If we can agree that poverty, economic marginalization, et cetera, have a strong interdependence with the color of one's skin, what are your foundations doing to directly address racism and white dominance in your strategies? Ooh, wait. <laughs> I'm telling you, there, there's a, there are a lot of good questions here. I feel like well, I to... you know, I actually said to um, Fred when we first started, I was like, you know, you better be brilliant. This is your hometown. I have to go home to Detroit, so I'm gonna let him answer. No, I'm right. <laughs> so, I, go ahead. I, I can jump in if you want. I'll... So. No, I mean, so I would say this. I think that we are just on a beginning on a journey to really think about how we can influence it and how our philanthropic dollars can. So I would just say, I mean, I think it, I, so I struggle with the question a little bit because I think that what we're asking is how do you use philanthropy, which is a tool of, um, it's a tool of a capitalistic society <laughs> to challenge the capitalistic society um, in which race has played a role in both, right? Like in building wealth and um, 
and, and, and not having access to wealth? And I don't know the answer to that. I, um, that's why I'd like to say I'm an ideapreneur because I can think about it and you guys won't get mad at me. Well, well, <laughs> so, it, well Fred, go ahead. Try yeah. to answer that, but I, I can also put a little bit more of a frame on it for you with another yeah. question, Tanya, after Fred yeah. responds. So um, the, the question that was asked by whoever put that out there is exactly um, the question that we are trying to answer at the San Francisco Foundation, mm -hmm. which is why um, we have completely reorganized our work around a North Star that is about achieving a greater degree of racial and economic inclusion at a regional level of scale. And we are intentionally starting that sentence with the word race. Uh, and I think that it is important uh, for us first to um, be bold enough to talk about the fact that race is an important frame on these issues that we're talking about. So I think that that is one piece. I want to tell a little bit of a story, though, because where we started uh, was not with the notion that we were going to completely blow up our existing the way we were organized uh, and go in this, in this way. We started by saying, what would it look like to apply a racial equity frame or lens to our existing body of work? Uh, and uh, when we went through that exercise, we came to the conclusion uh, that just adding a new wrinkle uh, to what we were already doing, one of our trustees characterized it as putting uh, old wine in new bottles uh, and uh, talk, challenged us that if we were really serious about achieving racial equity, we needed to start with that and work backwards around um, what we needed to achieve. So that we went from being organized around issues like education, arts and culture, environment, community development, to being organized around what we thought were the pathways to equity, which are people, place, and the most important, power. Uh, and so investing in advocacy, investing in leadership, investing in, uh, in, investing in amplifying the political voice of the communities that we're talking about, we concluded was going to be a very important part of the work. How, though, has our current political climate, the way things have played out in the last year, shifted or adjusted your focus or approach right around these things? Because in many ways, what's happening nationally, what's happening statewide has an enormous impact on cities, right? I mean, you are operating in cities that don't always have control over much bigger structural forces. I mean, Tanya, I think about Flint, right, and, and the Mott Foundation, and they're in, they've been embedded there for a really long time, right? They've been doing deep philanthropy there for a very long time, but there's been that decline despite, because there just are always much bigger structural forces at play. Yeah. And so I'm curious if that's had an effect in terms of, you know, where you need to focus your energy in terms of where to take Detroit. So I want to say, um, I'd love to answer that question, but I want to just step back for a second on this other question. So I think much of what Fred talked about are the same kinds of strategies that we've been committed to. I don't think, I would say the difference with the Skillman Foundation is that we had not put race in the middle of it. I mean, when you're in a city that is predominantly African American, um, it, it didn't feel like at that point that we needed to name it, but I would say it was a, a mistake. Hmm. And so today we do name it. Um, and so we're naming it and applying it to the strategy. So I think we started with strategy first and then put the frame in second. And uh, I, in hindsight, I wish I would have, we would have done it differently. But the second thing I would say about it in getting to this political discourse issue is that um, Michigan, and particularly Southeastern Michigan, is one of the most segregated communities in the country. Michigan, which I sometimes call Mississippi, um, is a very tense place when it comes to race. Now, I told you about this work that I did with this coalition in, when I was in Lansing. Um, which is our state capital, um, I made a comment simply, this is not philanthropy's job. I had two press releases that were put out by legislators 
about how essentially I was getting too uppity for my position. Now, I had a white Republican who said far worse, but he did, wasn't in the press release, right? So I, the point that I'm trying to raise is that like the dynamics of race, the dynamics of power are quite present in everything that we do. So we have to be conscious of it all the time, particularly in the environment that I'm working in. And, but what I have felt most hopeful about is that when we built this coalition um, in Detroit that included people who had intensely different positions and we got them to be able to work together, we believe that what we're doing is building a civic muscle that is going to be the model not just for our um, city but for our state. And so we are constantly pushing this, this discussion about how you create real discourse and that you can come up with real solutions because we feel like, I personally feel like that's not what is happening in our country. It's not happening in our state, but we are pushing and trying to lead those conversations because I, I would love to say that I live I, well, sometimes I used to, we used to live in a, um, a blue state, but <laughs> turned red this last time. Um, I have to live in those realities where there are intense positions on different uh, issues. And so I, my goal is to make sure that people understand that w they are being understood and that they understand other people's perspective. And I don't think that that exists. Um, in the way, and I think a lot of times when we talk about it in the country in general, uh, and this is no, I am not trying to give shade to California uh, or New York, but we tend to think about, we talk about these issues on a coastal, um, in a coastal debate, and, and on the coast, the politics are very different than the rest of the country. And I think that we need to be figuring out, the rest of the country has to figure out how to have these real debates and conversations that doesn't take us backwards, but actually takes us forward. Well, I can only imagine what's happening nationally and who we have currently in power is putting added pressure on that existing tension as it is. Fred, you wanted to get in here? Yeah, I, I do want to talk about the current um, political climate, and I want to talk about it from a few different um, perspectives. Um, one is, you know, this work that I described that we were doing around, they are doing around race and, and equity was work that we embarked on and completed before um, November of 2016. Um, because it was clear before the election um, that w this country and this region had issues around race and equity. Uh, and it was clear uh, uh, post-election that uh, no matter who won, there was work for us to do around uh, the fanning of the flames of division that were going on at multiple levels and the, the othering and demonizing of certain communities. And so I, I think for us, the current political climate, our response to it is actually to double down on the issues that we were raising uh, prior to that. The second thing about the political climate is that this, and I want to talk specifically about tax reform right now, what we are seeing right now is the first shoe to drop. The next shoe to drop is the discussion about how we can no longer afford uh, the basic safety net services that are supposed to be supplied by government, be, government because now they're not concerned about the deficit, but when it gets to f figuring out what we're going to fund, there's going to be all of a sudden a lot of concern about the deficit and what that means in terms of uh, expenditures. And that will have a trickle-down dramatic effect at the local level because stuff rolls downhill. Um, <laughs> the, the other thing that I would say, though, is that for me, the discourse that I'm um, hearing the policies that are being pushed out um, are deja vu. And they're deja vu because here in California, uh, in the early 90s, we were in the exact same conversation. Uh, you know, the, um, the, the governor uh, was pushing out um, uh, three strikes 
um, 187, uh, rolling back of affirmative action, uh, demonizing immigrants and refugees and talking about how they were uh, killing the economy. I mean, the same stuff that was talked about then uh, is talked about now. And what's interesting about it is that there's a demographic component to this. It was a question about whose state is this? The demographics were changing, and folks were feeling real anxious about the demographics changing, and they were willing to go pull back the curtain and vote on that fear. And it's the same thing that's happening right now at the national level. Last thing I want to say about this, and again, it gets to uh, some of what Tanya was talking about in terms of the coast. Um, it is great to be in a dark blue region <laughs> in a blue state. Um, because we get to have a, a lot of kind of conversations uh, like this one. But at the same time, uh, if you are a person of color, uh, if you are low income, um, if you have any other kind of characteristic that isn't about kind of the mainstream, you don't feel uh, like you're in that bubble. Mm -hmm. And you often feel like you are outside of the bubble looking in. Uh, so if you think about criminal justice issues, school issues, housing issues, access to opportunity issues, um, our perceptions of ourselves in this region are out of line with reality. Uh, and we think that we're progressive, and we like to kind of talk about the fact that we voted right in November, but we haven't really fixed the inequality and the inequity issues, and in fact, Places like New York and places like San Francisco are ground zero for the kind of hand-wringing around equity that folks have been talking about. Tanya, do you want to address what effect broader structural forces are having on Detroit? Or I can also move on. Like I said, there are so many questions here. And also, I'm so glad there's going to be a reception after this, because then the questions that we don't get to, you can be sure to ask people, because there are a lot of very interesting ones, but they're also very specific ones. Yeah. So. Well, I, I mean, I want to lift up a couple things around. I, I agree 100% um, with uh, what Fred just shared. And I, I would just lift up a couple other things. So one is this um, issue, um, particularly that I care deeply about in the impact sector, is that um, the repeal of the Johnson Amendment mm -hmm. is a really big deal. Um, and the reason it's a big deal is basically we are allowing our um, kind of nonprofit or for impact sector to now be um, uh, tools of this kind of partisan debate. Like it's just going to get worse, right? Like so now you can have churches join the fray, right? Like they are going to be able to spend their time and interest on kind of focusing on partisan issues rather than in creating a civic infrastructure. Um, I think that that is going to be um, in a really important cultural shift for us in a way where you will see many people who will no longer trust the kind of trusting and helping sector. And that um, is a loss to us, right? It, it is a loss to our civility, our civil society. Um, I would also just say that I think um, that we, and, and, and Fred talked about this a little bit, uh, so I'm tilting the question a little bit, is that we have to stop focusing on our politicians. Um, not that I don't think that we need to spend time fixing the politics, Absolutely, we do. But this is a time, I think, in our country when we need to, ex we need to exercise our democratic um, rights and our democratic ability to lead this country out of this nonsense that we're in. Because I just don't see it happening without us standing up. Mm -hmm. I, because to be a politician, you have to be almost in an echo chamber, right? Like, and so we are we are this country. Um, and 
I just, you know, I agree and I do think like we are seeing, this is my opinion, the last gasp of some of the old ways in our country. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping and praying it's a last gasp. Um, but I also think and understand how this country operates. So I, Mina was saying in the back room, like people shouldn't say things. If they know it's gonna be provocative, then why say it? And I'm one of those people, I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I meant something very different by that. But, <laughs> but what, I, what I mean by this is, is, is that this country, when it's gotten to a place where we start to see whiteness get outnumbered, whiteness expands. Yeah. It shifts, it morphs. And I think that we need to be conscientious about that, that it is very easy. It, we can't just say, oh, it's, our country is going to be a brown country. No. <laughs> mixed race people will no longer be mixed race people. They will be white, right? And, uh, and I was saying this to colleagues of mine, and they were looking at me like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, aren't you Italian? Yes. Well, 100 years ago, you weren't white. 50 years ago, Jewish people weren't white. So we, we will morph this country. Now, I need to stop because I know I'm really, I'm about to get hurt. <laughs> I, I'm like, right now, it's hate mail. It's kind of all kind of well, stuff on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> well, just don't, think about Don't worry, it. this is just being live streamed, so. <laughs> I know. Well, There's the end of my political career. I don't have one. <laughs> Nor was I anticipating well, one. <laughs> a couple things. One is what I was trying to say back there was when people premise their comments with like, I'm going to say something that some people are going to find offensive or I'm going to say something that's sort of off color. And I'm always just like, just don't say it. <laughs> like, don't I worry, you don't have to say it. But advice. I don't think what you're trying to say that that would not qualify under that umbrella. But OK, let's let's bring it down, because I do think that this is a very this is an interesting question and kind of a looking ahead question that is for you, Tanya, it says, Detroit thrive thanks in large part to the economic engine that was the car industry. Mm -hmm. What do you see as the driver of economic growth in the region going forward? What industry gets Detroit to SF wealth in 40 years that without all the displacement? Right, so I would say a couple of things. I think that Detroit, like most uh, communities today, can't rely solely on a singular industry anymore. And I, but, we love the auto industry. So, but I think what we have to do as a city is to really embrace the mobility industry um, inside of our city. And I think that we're doing it as autos are moving to a more mobile industry. Like they are thinking how you move people rather than move cars and vehicles. And I think we have to embrace that. The second thing is, is that Detroit has one of the highest and largest um, uh, um, design communities in the country. And so I think that we have to really maximize that. Um, and then as well as logistical. So um, I think that we have a lot of assets in our community that we haven't necessarily um, used. So if there's a widget that you want made, like Detroit can make it for you. Now we don't think we can because we think we know how to just make tires and car seats and you know seats and cars and things like not children's car seats, um, but those we have the skill set to be able to do that. Um, and then I think the last is is that um, we have also a um, very strong blue economy in our region. We are the Great Lakes state, and so these are all of the assets that I think we have underestimated as a result of that, and that we're seeing actually come to play. We're seeing a lot of creativity that's coming out of it. And then the last thing I would say, and I think it's been an important play, and I actually think that philanthropy has contributed pretty significantly to this, is because we were such a one big, large corporate uh, industry town, um, and the way that we became that large corporate industry town was because we had amazing entrepreneurs, we had stopped really producing entrepreneurs in, in our region and particularly in Detroit. And so we've been investing a great deal in our city and trying to 
um, build and invest in this next generation of entrepreneurs that will drive the kind of economic growth that we want to see and making sure that those entrepreneurs are entrepreneurs of color um, as well, not just because of their own wealth creation, um, but because people of color tend to hire other people of color. I mean, this is going to be the way I think that we're going to help a predominantly largely um, African-American city move into a stronger economic position. But for San Francisco, Fred, I mean, how do you, is it going to be the tech industry or is that going to be our big corporate, are we going to become yeah. too beholden to that? I mean, so, what's the engine of San Francisco moving forward? That you can send one of the tech yeah. companies to Detroit. We'll take one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the thing. We actually talked a little bit about this on the, on the prep call. And one of the things that I was saying was that among the things that I admire about Detroit is this aspect of the work that the, the Fords and the GMs and the, the folks that have developed very strong industries in Detroit are like, yeah, Detroit is my place. That's my town. It's a, you know, it, we're a company town. And, and there are exceptions to what I'm about to say. Uh, Salesforce, uh, I think, view San Francisco as their town. And there are a few uh, others. But the vast majority of the tech companies here in the Bay Area uh, view their connection to the Bay Area as, as an address and only. only. Uh, and that they view uh, selves, uh, themselves as players on a global scale. Uh, and therefore don't see the responsibility that they have to support their town. It, it, they, these tech companies don't view themselves in that way. And so that is one place where I'm actually envious of Detroit hmm. in terms of what they have because there is this connection to place. And so I don't know if the tech industry is going to be uh, that industry hmm. for the Bay Area in terms of trying to address the, the challenges that are facing uh, this community, because you have to, in order for a corporation to come to the conclusion that that's their role, they have to come to the conclusion that they're not agnostic about place and that um, being here matters. I think what's been interesting is this current that I feel like has gone through kind of everything we've talked about today, which is even when it comes to not just revitalizing communities the right way or trying to address uh, racism or racial segregation. So much of what you've talked about or even, you know, how to get corporations invested has been about trusting the people who, who live, who work, who understand and experience what's happening in communities to really guide the decision making, not just of, um, not just of uh, education or local government, but also a philanthropy, right? So, you know, we just have a few minutes left, and I guess the question that I have is, what do you think, being that these are your hometowns, right? I mean, you grew up here, Fred, and <laughs> you grew up in Oakland, but you, mm -hmm. you know, you're from the Bay Area, mm -hmm. and Tanya, you definitely, Detroit's your hometown, so what does that give you as philanthropy leaders? How do you think that has influenced your approach to solving problems in your regions? So um, I think it, this is not going to be a necessarily a satisfying answer. But for me, um, it, it's as simple as the fact that I can't go uh, into the grocery store without somebody asking me, what's up, what we're doing? You know, how are you positioning the San Francisco Foundation? And when I was in local government, uh, you know, what are you going to do about my cracked sidewalk? Um, and so there is a, uh, a level of accountability associated with um, growing up in, being in uh, these places, and people knowing where you live and who your family is. I, you know, I get people coming up to me, afraid you haven't returned my phone call, I'm going to tell your mom. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, that, that's real. Uh, and so... <laughs> And so, you know, and, and Tanya described it, too, in terms of having family members who were those pension right. uh, folks. I mean, when you have that level of skin in the game, it brings a certain level of passion uh, for you. Uh, and I think it compels you to kind of call out, call the question, talk about the elephant in the room, be courageous about the, uh, the issues that you are raising, because it's your community, too. Uh, and I think that that's important. 
So I would I would agree with that because uh, it, it, that is not something that everybody experiences. And I remember um, my uh, mentor and predecessor, Carol Goss, um, would always say, you know, I get stopped in the grocery store and they're not stopping these other foundation presidents. And I was like, because they don't even know who they are. They know who you are, and that is a gift in itself. And I would say I feel like um, it is a gift for me as well. And um, so I would just say two quick things about Amina. One is I have decided to lead the Skillman Foundation as an unapologetic African-American woman. The reason why is this. I come with a set of experiences and insights and knowledge that people who generally run foundations don't come with. And if I cover that, then what is the use of having diversity and inclusion? <laughs> my, job, my job is to essentially bring the fullness of my experience to see if that fullness of experience when combined with other people's experiences can help us produce a different set of solutions. And that's what I am trying to do. And I, you know, so I, I, try, I focus on that, I have an accountability on that. And then the last thing is, is that I'm unapologetic about trying to build power. Because as Fred said, Power is what creates change. I'm not trying to build it for myself. I don't, I'm not particularly interested in being a powerful person, but I am particularly interested in building power that will actually create change. Uh, and that, that power is deployed with love. An action verb, right? <laughs> Tanya Allen, CEO of the Skillman Foundation in Detroit. And Fred Blackwell. Fred Blackwell, CEO of the San Francisco Foundation. Thanks both of you for being on the panel. And thank you to our audience. Again, I really encourage you to ask some of the questions that I wasn't able to get to on the cards. And also, we want to thank our audiences in radio, television, and the internet. We want to remind everyone that there's a reception outside this room immediately following the program. I'm Mina Kim, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned.